I'm curious what your favorite movie piece of advice that you've received is, or what's your favorite piece of advice to share with other designers or illustrators? Listen to this podcast. <laughs> Listen <laughs> more to Josh <laughs> and the Obsessed Podcast. Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with illustrator and package designer, Apram Lule. Born and raised in Mexico, Abraham, as I'll probably call him for most of the show, describes his body of illustration, typography, packaging work, and design as design with a human touch. His spectrum of skills is flexible and ever-changing, bringing a truly unique crafted flair that is undeniable in his work. He's worked for clients such as Facebook, Capitol Records, Jose Cuervo, and Diageo. He's also a typography excellence medalist, and the Type Directors Club recently chose him to be an ascender. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Apram Lule. Okay, kids, all the way from New York City, I'm chatting with Abraham Lule. Abraham, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Josh, for having me. Well, hey, um, I think I have to wrap myself out here because this is not the first time we have talked. We had a, we had a major Zoom fail, which which may have been completely human error on my part or may have actually been a Zoom problem. We may never know. But this is actually the second time we're attempting this recording. So thank you so much for doing this again and uh, humoring me with another try. Oh, of course, it's my pleasure. <laughs> it, it was me who who canceled that that recording. I just wanted to chat with you again. <laughs> you sabotaged it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You're like, you know what? I think I could do better on the second try. Let's do one more. <laughs> <laughs> I literally thought that. <laughs> Why don't have that power on your well? You, on your you got your wish. You got your wish. <laughs> I don't know what kind of voodoo you're doing there in New York, but that's that's some <laughs> some good work. Um, you know, one of the things that I joked about last time was this whole Ascender Award. Like that is yeah. about the coolest sounding thing that I think that you could you could aspire to. So tell us a little bit about that before we jump into your origin story. How did how did that come to be? Yeah, yeah, sure. It, it, well, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Uh, senders are like these um, group, of, I think it's 10 under 35 typographers at the Type Directors Club. Uh, we submit, but they create the, like kind of the pool, the roster of each year. And you have like a mini ceremony with an exhibition. You get like a very cool award and everything. But I think like the real uh, prize of, of being part of this Ascenders group is to share with the Typographics Club what like this kind of organization that has been in the typographic industry for so long, and um, and they have such knowledge and and such capacity to to really keep nurturing the discipline. So being part of it is like not like being touched by the gods, but but you know, <laughs> like a typographer that that under thirty five is quite an achievement. Also because I think they they do recognize that. To really call yourself a typographer, you might be in your fifties, you might be in your sixties. Like mm -hmm. they, they just prize or they award people that is really, really consolidated in their fields, like consecrated typographers. So, so yeah, it felt like it felt like I just like upgraded or like you know when you are playing <laughs> video games and you cross the next level. It, it felt a bit like that. You um, leveled up. Exactly that same. <laughs> <laughs> they were very smart with the name. Yeah, yeah. I have to say. Well, hey, um, as we've been talking with all of our guests here recently, of course, we're recording during COVID. Um, as we're recording, it's August 2020. Um, you're one of many people that I've just coincidentally kind of run together on all these New York interviews in a row. How are things for you? Like, were you were you working like solo in your place before or were you going to an office or how is how have things changed for you yeah it's interesting and and also like going back to the story that this is the second time that we record this i think like everything changes like by week to week yeah it's um, probably different than it was last friday <laughs> exactly so i have a different answer uh no um well, because I was doing these transitions from um, going from the studio that I used to be, from going solo, uh, I actually just 
I think I signed my lease on my studio on March the 10th, something oh, like man. that. <laughs> <laughs> After all the search and all the, the, like, just hunting for the perfect place, you know, I found a gorgeous, uh, gorgeous place in um, the Brooklyn Navy Yard that I was totally in love with. And then uh, I was starting to doing that commute, like, you know, like getting familiar mm -hmm. with the neighborhood and everything. Um, but this is, by the way, like a subway ride, a ferry ride, and a walk, but it's totally worth it because it was beautiful. Um, so then eventually we did like this switch of like, well, now we need to be in the lockdown. And as all, all designers, you might know, like we are used to being in captivity. We were used to being in our four walls. Yeah. But of course, it felt like a change to me uh, in a matter of what what makes you New York unique is also like the ability to go out and connect with others and to see these other places and get uh, stimulated by everything, like the streets, the, the sounds, the, the stores, the, the museums, again, like, <laughs> you know, like concerts, shows, everything. And from one day to another, you get that stimulation out of a person. Yeah. Um, so that would be like, for me, it's a bit cathartic. Like it felt like, like quite a change, even if I'm used to working from home, but you know, the surrounding changed so fast. And as you also might know, the, the amount of people that unfortunately was getting sick here in New York, it was enormously higher, like yeah, in comparison to other states. So being close to that was also very hard to to deal with on top of life, of course, you need to be on top of your game. You need to be doing great because you're starting your like, solo show. And now, um, well, now you need to do it during these conditions. And that wasn't the easiest part. So you had been solo for how long when COVID hit? <laughs> like, officially, officially, like two months. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in all fairness, what a time to start your business. <laughs> I literally just posted that when when that happened, like because I had the <laughs> whole studio and I was feeling so cocky about my place. But um, but when I was doing uh, my full time job at the agency, I was already doing freelance, and mm -hmm. I never stopped uh, freelancing even when I was working in Mexico. So in a way, that was like my warm up, like <laughs> like my five year warm up. <laughs> to then have my my solo thing <laughs> um but but yeah I mean, it was so time perfect <laughs> like i started <laughs> and then, then pandemic started too so um i feel like we've implied a lot of these touch points here but let's rewind a little bit and tell our listeners about your your origin story um obviously coming from mexico and all the way to to new york city now fast forward to the coronavirus and your your new business <laughs> all at the same time journey. how did we get there how how'd you get started well well this is going to go back in the day when i was probably five <laughs> or or even three years old um i feel like i was a kind of kid that even if i was in sports my passion was really in illustration and drawing. Like I didn't know that was the name, but for me it was coloring books and getting my attention around it. Uh, I was getting so like, I don't know how is it called, but it was this drawing of Lloyd Looney Tunes that it was, mm -hmm. you move one thing and it's black and then you move it and you see another image that might have like, it's like an optic illusion. All these little crafts inside the book, it was something that it was really interesting. Uh, and then eventually I just found myself like doing more and more and more of that. And most of it was what we know, like packaging sketches. <laughs> That's what I know it's called <laughs> Typical now, kids but... drawing packaging. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I don't know. I feel like it was something that always caught my attention. I feel like even I remember buying things, you know, like you buy things by the pack, you get attracted by certain things by the pack. And I was getting so like, hooked by it um so i have this story when i was uh my father is a doctor i used to be with him in like going to pick up uh, medicines and pharmacies and all that and i remember we were in a pharmacy and there was like a like a cooler with ice pops and there was this amazing packaging of a like a i think it was like a pomegranate uh hibiscus uh, ice pop and it was like a like a picture of a vampire 
And I was like, oh my God, I just want to do that. I just want to draw this <laughs> vampire. And I would love to do that for like, as my father is a doctor, I would love to do this. Um, and then I also like, that eventually came to like a more of an obsession. So then I got a, like a job in a small bodega in the corner for, in the corner store where I was used to live. I think by then I was 10. And the guy hired me to like, you know, being talking with customers and everything and, and selling. So everything, what I, all what I was doing was accommodating the packages by colors. And, and, <laughs> uh, and I was so obsessed by learning the ingredients. I don't know why I was so obsessed by the ingredients and the way the accommodation of that, uh, like huge amount of text was fitting tiny spaces, mm -hmm. uh, which <laughs> we all know what it is to, to deal with that. Um, but I was just like telling clients, like, look at this packaging and look at this character and look at this and look at that. Um, I never saw anything, but, <laughs> but it was, I was good to talk about the packaging. And I remember even like, because of course, like where I'm from, it, it's a small city in Mexico. Um, it was almost like my, my, father, my mom and my, and my dad got separated when I was around six. So I was living with my mom and, and I remember this time that of course it, money wasn't like just pouring from, from, from the sky. Um, it was, it was tough, but I remember that my mom was like, well, what you're going to be, you should be an architect. Like you, mm -hmm. but we knew that it was like something useful, you know, yeah, <laughs> like you, People will uh, definitely and, pay you to do that. <laughs> I don't exactly, know about drawing yeah. Looney Tunes and packages. <laughs> exactly. She was like, you can draw. So the closest I know is like, you should do architecture. And she actually gave me a book about architecture, like very, like not even one drawing. It was all text. And I was probably, yeah, like 10. I was, oh my God. Yeah, this is so interesting. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and it was, but... Then I made up this story of like, you know that the guy who did the Coca-Cola logo is getting paid by the, by, by, the, by the bottle. So when you see a logo of Coca-Cola, that person is getting paid for each bottle. And I was like, oh, really? Where you learn that? And I was like, you just know it. So I, I want to do that. I want to draw the logos and you'll see that I'll get an income. Maybe I'll draw a logo that is everywhere. And so then I'll get paid by the object. And I was like, well, that's, that sounds something. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing that you had that, um, that awareness, because I think a lot of kids see graphic design or see things that they're attracted to when they're younger, um, and don't think of it as a profession. They just know that they like it. So it sounded like you started there, but you quickly figured out that people got paid to do this stuff. And that's a job that you wanted to do. I feel like it's the story that I was selling to myself mm -hmm. to convince me because I think I, and this is, this is something that I'm a bit embarrassed about, but I think I, I heard the word graphic design like later in my life, like mm -hmm. later I'm talking about like 20 years old, like yeah. later. Um, because for me, then it was like, then advertising was something that it was something similar. I was so uneducated on, on all these, in all these regard. And, but you know, like there was something interesting. It was like a passion. Like actually I studied graphic design completely by chance. Like, as I said, money wasn't like in our, in our best. And my mom got a job at, at a university that one of the benefits was a full-time scholarship for her kids. Mm -hmm. And it was me who was uh, in the kind of like college time. Yeah. And my mom was like, well, there's no advertising, but they have graphic design. What do you think? Close enough. <laughs> well, like, <laughs> no, I was like, well, no, that's not what I'm studying. I'm studying uh, uh, advertising. I was in Argentina studying ad advertising. Then I, I went back to Mexico, kept studying advertising. And then my mom was like, we cannot afford, afford advertising. You need to take what we have. <laughs> And actually, one of the teachers in the advertising school told me, like, I think you would be a better graphic designer, actually. Mm -hmm. I think you have the capabilities to be a good graphic designer. So we're like, let's see. And it turned out okay. <laughs> Turns out that teacher might have been onto something. Um, 
So one of the things I'm curious about is, um, is your process. So you've got, um, you know, looking at your portfolio, you've got all of these amazing colors and it feels very illustrative. And one of the things that we had talked about before is, um, how, so I've, I've had very little exposure to being in Mexico and in like Mm -hmm. touristy areas or big cities. Like I've had some kind of random visits there. Like one was a mission trip where I was in Tampico and I was really in tiny, tiny towns and like, you know, not very populated. And the signage that I would see and the packaging that I would see was gorgeous, but it was all hand painted. It's all one off. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at your portfolio, I see hints of that, um, which was so interesting, almost like, almost like it's a typeface, you know, that, that the Mm. hand drawn thing that I was seeing in Tampico is something that I see in your work. Um, I'm curious what your process looks like. How do you get that hand drawn thing? Is it starting with pencil or, you know, are you painting and then scanning? Are you straight into illustrator and everything's digital or what's that process look like for you? I feel like it is very interesting because I feel like that is something that also I think you, it is in the culture in Mexico, in all these communities, because I feel like we, it is like making the best out of what you have. And most of it is not a lot. So you need to do like something very attractive with, this is just a paint and here's a brush and come on, go. And, and I think it's something that I, that I, that I still do. Now that I have a little bit more resources. Um, I want to, for me, what I want to do at the beginning, like, uh, and that's what I do, is pushing myself into doing um, what I can do without the use of computer or without any other stimulation. Just what the client is telling me, a notebook, and and I just start like doodling, writing, uh, like in, imagining. I think like for me, imagination is like really the spark of everything. Mm-hmm. Like, The imagination is when you are really using what you have already in your brain, like all these data, (laughs) you know, that that you have already storage there for years and then you start using it. Um, And then I feel like sometimes going to the like well-known hub of images and stimulation on the Internet, most likely references of others, you know, ends up pushing you to do something as a competitive way. I'm going to do it better or my end of, end of, end up sorry look the same so so i think that for me is that very important is to always start out of the computer and most of the, all the time uh, clients do want to keep that flair of imperfection which for me is is great like when you see when you can tell that someone actually like a person did this and it's not just computer generated is something that i think uh, and i've seen that brands are engaging more and more and more so they can humanize their their names right they can humanize their companies um so yeah in in answer to your question this is pretty much the process like me doodling then if the piece if the if the final project or the final product is something handcrafted i always scan everything i always take photos um i have developed my <laughs> and i'm raising my eyebrows because i develop like a system to to get more transparency when are like sign painting things mm-hmm. or if it's like something that needs to look like has been actually drawn on onto the label like developing something to look like that because for me that is where authenticity is so that's all also like a concept that every brief has like <laughs> we want to be authentic you know, like and that, yeah, I don't blame them um, because I feel like authenticity is something that it speaks to everyone. But mm-hmm. most of the times authenticity is coming from from our hands, what we can do as an individual. And when software is very useful, also colonizes us a little bit. Like if you just open software, you'll see like a color palette already established there, like certain fonts there, layouts like we have A4, like, you know, like you go to the to what you are told to use. Mm-hmm. And this is practicality. But then if, when you can do that by yourself, you can be more in touch with how the actual product or the end product is going to feel like and look like. And might you come with a different format that is more interesting than an A4, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so, so, yeah, that's pretty much how my process is like. So what is maybe a normal day look like for you? Are you typically working on client work? And if so, is it more 
design based or more illustration based or more more package design you know what where do you spend the most of your time most of the time is more packaging for alcohol um which is something that that kind of includes a lot of things like it's illustration it is typography it's um a bit like a, a industrial design too like you are in charge of like how the how the bottle should look like, like how the structure design is, like what is experience of opening this bottle, what is experience of touching it. So it's like, I feel like more complex than just an illustration, um, but it's also more strategic. So most of the times packaging design is more, is, is about how it looks, but had like a huge base and foundation behind. Like if you are doing a redesign, it is not a revolution, but maybe like a slight evolution. So all these mm-hmm. things is something that, of course, takes longer than just drawing something beautiful on a label. Um, and and yeah, that's most of the times most of my work. I have like really tiny gaps where I can do something personal. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is, you know, I, I feel blessed that I have work. But sometimes I also feel like I should balance it a bit more with more personal work. Uh, so what I do is I end up taking a client projects as personal. So I get very involved with their brands and I use them like, oh, this is my project too. So a bit, mm-hmm. I, I'm a bit more passionate <laughs> to to fulfill that other side. Um, and there is a little bit more of a, like a just lettering uh, work that it, most of the times is, you know, like for me, lettering is the, the middle of in between illustration and typography. Like if you have those in a line, what is in the middle is lettering, where you mm-hmm. can see the text being an image. So that's what I do outside of doing packaging. That is like like a ten percent, <laughs> but the other like is like a sixty percent packaging and ten percent um, lettering, and then the other thirty is branding. And most of the branding work is very illustrative. Mm-hmm. Um, which is also fun to do. How did you, I'm sure there's a lot of designers listening who are like, man, I would love to do packaging design or I would love to do design for alcohol. Like how did you find your way into that particular niche? Like how did you break into that industry? It was like, I really just knocked the door of someone that I knew that it was doing it. And also knew this person is, is from a town that I used to live in Mexico, but I also knew that his packaging was bad. <laughs> so I was like, I had a friend of a friend that, that knew him. I was like, Hey, you know, this guy just sent me his contact. Um, I was working freelance back then in Mexico mm-hmm. and I literally just sent him, I, we set up a call. I visited him with a PDF. Uh, he told me, well, I'm working with someone else and I'm not, I don't, I'm not in need with any other designer, but I'll call you if I have anything. And this client is Gracias a Dios, my gym project, who then called me to redesign the label of the gym. Um, and I remember, and I still remember by heart, like I, from my heart, the meeting with the client because he showed this to his partners too. And this presentation was like pencil sketches, rough sketches, Mm -hmm. and a tiny mood board, like five images next to a pencil sketch, two pages. That's it. Yeah. One of of the partners was like, is this going to be black and white? Is it going to be like a doodle? (laughs) Of course. Like, and, and, but he knew like uh, the guy who, uh, Jaime, who hired me, he kind of like had the intuition, like design intuition. Mm -hmm. He was like, I think I, I love it. And the other partner was like, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Like he almost walked out of the, the room and he was like, I hate it. I hate it. We ended up doing it. We ended up doing it. And then like four years after I did that one, he hired me to redesign it, which is the three jeans that I have now on my portfolio and mm-hmm. has been like well received by everybody. Um, and and now then the one day this partner saw me and was like, man you did a great job the one they didn't like it done. <laughs> <laughs> and that was well that project is it was kind of like my key to enter this world one uh, after i did that one 
I did a case study with like everything was like turquoise colors. And then I think that was the reason Bolt 49 ended up hiring me to, for the full position here in New York. And once I was with them, all what I did was packaging design for alcohol. Like you call mm-hmm. it rum, whiskey, tequila, mezcal, like the different like liqueurs and and well, mostly Bailey's. Like I, I spent a lot of time on that brand um, that I'm very proud of. And I, yeah, I think like then you put that work out there. And if, if you guys can take this on, as an advice is once you have a good piece, it just takes one thing for mm. you to start getting more and more. Because the next project is going to be, if not the same quality, more if you have developed that that skill. And then that is going to attract more. And then it's going to attract more and more and more and more and more and more and more. And the more you're involved and the more you attract, uh, you attract those, those things. Well, that's how my story was. You know, it's interesting that um, one of the very first interviews that I had for the show is with an illustrator named Von Glitschka. And, and he was reiterating this story from a friend of his, another illustrator. So I make it a Vaughn's quote at this point, but it was, it was another guy's quote. And he was talking about that same idea. He said, look, you get the work you show. So you've mm-hmm. got this one great example that you put out there. And that's, that's a great way to attract more. Like if you put, I don't know, newspaper advertisements up on your, <laughs> on your portfolio mm-hmm. website, that's probably what people would ask you to do because that's what they see. Um, so do you work with, um, like agents or help to like get new work or is it entirely just having work out on, on the web and getting good response? I have my agent like closer and closer, um, um, with Drew Melton and team, uh, they are a great team who helped me also to like attract more clients, uh, but also to manage a bit more of my like the other the work itself um organizing it a bit more um but i feel like all these works as a like a like a team is a team effort like if you do something i do something and eventually we'll we'll get uh more for us mm-hmm. um which like by more it doesn't mean that is good but when we you have a, a support system i think for me it's like Regardless of, of attracting more clients, for me, what it's having an agent, it's having a support system. Like everyone needs a support system. Um, so if you if you are as a freelancer, is one of the things that you need the most because you're going to have clients, and the client has a whole right to being tough with you, on you. But um, you need that support system to keep telling you like, you can make it. You'll be great. It's okay. You need you know like everyone needs a like. A, a partner in crime and yeah. having an agent is, is that kind of support system to me. Very cool. Um, tell us about one of your proudest professional moments. Well, going back at the beginning of this conversation, it was the Sanders was one of the, one of those, uh, well, is uh, what I have in my head right now is, is one of the proudest too. Um, it was because of what I said, like being part of the Thai Directors Club and it feel like an honor to me. Um, but also that was really close to getting my, my, they call it talent visa, like, mm. because to being an independent uh, worker in the States as a Mexican, I needed to have, like, I need to do that process. So one of the parts of getting these kind of visas is showing your, that you have recognition for what you do. And the ascenders came exactly when I needed it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So I feel like, yeah, the achievement of, of getting that because of my effort, like my, my own effort, that felt like really, really like a, like a, like a milestone to me. Uh, that's one of my proudest moments, receiving that award and, and receiving that visa, which it feels like the biggest award right now. Well, speaking of which, we we had talked about um, at the top of the show before we sort of jumped in about that that you've enjoyed working with some entrepreneurs in Mexico. How how has that kind of worked into your 
process or, or what's that like kind of corresponding with folks there? Yeah, this is a good story with clients um, because I was telling Josh, um, there is like this continuous case of like Mexicans going to other countries and starting something like, and most of the times it's something Mexican because it's what we know best. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and most, most of the times are tacos. <laughs> so you know, this, this guy in, in, in Finland and the other guy in Australia, their taquerias, uh, with, with Paolo in Australia, the Milpa Collective, uh, have worked. This is my sixth project with him. Hmm. All populating Bondi Beach in with tacos and good food. He hired me. I don't remember, like it was like six or seven years ago, hmm. through Behance, um, like this kind of project. That hey, I, I'm, I'm, I would like you to do this. I, I don't. I don't even know what he saw in my portfolio that told him that I would be able to do this. But we did Takisa the um, this goldy kind of Tulum inspired branding for his restaurant. And then we did Carbon and then we did La Palma and then we did Sonora. And then we did like, we have done like so many projects and, and it all started with one. We built a relationship and it started growing and growing and growing. But for me, like really the story is about someone that goes from Mexico to other places to, to keep growing in the experience of their own but also passing on to others what Mexican gastronomy and Mexican folklore is. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in a way, like I don't know if it's in our heritage or, or what it is, but I feel like most of the times it might be easier for us to express that because that is the same case for the kind of Finland, then another taqueria in Argentina, even projects that I have done here, like even for Baileys when I illustrated the uh, Tres Leches Baileys, like, there's always some kind of flair or like our, our folklore that is in, imprinted in, in, their, in these brands and in these businesses. So, um, yeah, it's, it is crazy that one thing to connect to the other in a way. Um, but also for me, is is about entrepreneurship uh, as Mexicans. Because even if, if Paulo is a chef, like he is a professional chef, uh, then they develop something else that they are not professionals uh, in, in the field. Like Jaime, who is uh, uh, the the gene owner of Casa Dios, he started out of curiosity. It, is, it only takes curiosity for you to start something else, and then you get more involved in the industry. Uh, and that is something that I take as a as a learning experience as well. For me, curiosity is that that is where it's, it's everything is probably even bigger than passion, like, because you can really see it. Like it is your observation on things. Like when, when you're gravitating towards to, and then even if you didn't go to an amazing school of any other field, yours, just your curiosity and your observation develop that and turn you into um, an expert. And that is what I see in, in, in my clients that have started their businesses like that. Yeah. I love that. I, I would imagine, um, as you said, with the first gentleman, like you didn't know what he even saw in your portfolio, but maybe he's seeing some of the things in you that you see in him, like his, mm -hmm. that he went somewhere else, that he's bringing that culture with him, that he's bringing that curiosity and, and, and maybe, maybe that's what he saw himself reflected in you and your work and kind of those, those similar values. That sounds very romantic. I, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, before we get too deep here, uh, maybe tell us about some of your design heroes. Like who did you pay mm. attention to when you were coming up in the industry or who do you look back at now and, um, with admiration? Well, whoever was that designer of the vampire ice pop, <laughs> that was my, <laughs> my, my reference. No, I'm kidding. Uh, um, I think I, I have my, like, um, how do you call it? Like my league of justice of design <laughs> <laughs> it is not just one um but of course for me saul Vaz, uh, has been like a, it's so 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 good mm -hmm. um and what i see in him is really like like 
how to brand something for films and talking about someone that is not really like he was a designer but he's also considered a filmmaker like mm-hmm. he is considered a film director because he was so involved in films that all the main titles and titled sequences it was really what it was setting up setting the voice of the tonal voice of the movie so it's like an intro and you really get into what the was the feeling of the movie by his work it yeah was with, so clever. with hitchcock in particular i think he would right. he would sketch out the keyframes of the of the movie like here's what the camera should show and here's how the person is in the so he was really seeing it in his sketchbook before the camera was ever on i mean so yeah it's mind-blowing to me like now that that we have like you know netflix taking over and all these really movies that we're seeing now and shows I wonder if there was like a second wave of that, like you start seeing more and more and more and more, but I don't know how, why we don't hear for another as old as <laughs> maybe I haven't. Well, through the magic of the internet, like we, you guys don't even know that we totally lost connection here for like five minutes, but, but we're back and we were talking about Saul Bass and design heroes. So I don't, I don't want to cut that conversation short. So what else were you about to say on that? Well, I don't know if you guys heard that I said, that for me, Saul Bass is like the Batman of this uh, League of Justice. Mm, yes, um, that's an important oh, note. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And then um, Debbie Millman, I think she's being uh, like a huge influence on me um, through the podcast Design Matters. I think is uh, when I was in Mexico, in all my college time, I was just listening to all the interviews like Massimo Vignelli, Stephen Heller, um, Milton Glaser and just listening to them and what they had to say and I think that for me the the ultimate like the best of all of them not to this this means the rest but um, Massimo Vignelli's one is so so mm-hmm. so good and what he has to say and he's so eloquent and and the way he expressed everything like that had huge impact on me I remember when I was listening to it, I was dreaming of coming to New York, you know, like when you see these heroes really, uh, it's almost like I need to be where they they walk. Like I, I need to be around them. I need to be on their streets. I need to be mm-hmm. if not like seated next to them, at least going to their, where they, I don't know, buy their bagels. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, like at least having like like that kind of same environment. I think when you uh, admire someone, th- for me, is a, like a like a good practice. Don't look at the work itself, but look what inspired them. And for me, is New York. Like when I think of of all these Saul Bass and and David Millman and Massimo Vignelli and all these consecrated designers, is they all being here in New York. So there is some something in the water <laughs> that 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 is shared. And that for me was a huge motivation to to come to to study here and then eventually moving like moving to to New York. And just to mention another one, I want to mention Alexander Alexander Girard. Sorry, Alexander Girard. Um, that is also like an amazing designer. Uh, he's an AIGA medalist. Um, and in this in this short video that they do of them, they said he designed everything, like from the spoon to the signage to the menu to the matches to the uh, mm-hmm. ashtray. Like he really designed everything, and he was a I think he was like by title a graphic designer, but his um, his approach on color and his approach on forms and it's it's something very interesting. But in a way, it's similar to. To what I at least try to do <laughs> when I when I design. Um, so yeah, uh, that's one You're of my need other to heroes. Design a spoon. <laughs> I think I have. <laughs> no, no, I haven't. I, I have tried, <laughs> but for the restaurant, but we didn't make it. <laughs> well, um, we have to ask this question because it's the one that we ask everyone, which is. And this could be life or packaging or spoons or film or whatever. But <laughs> what do you find that you are most obsessed with right now? Oh, man, I feel like 
I have to say this that I I don't find myself as a uh, I don't get too obsessed on things. <laughs> I have always been obsessed with vintage things, and that you can tell on, on my work as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but also feel like nowadays on the like deeper side, I've been obsessed with uh, the life, work, personal, uh, like balance of uh, mm-hmm. of of everyone like um in the in the past i was um a dance coach in mexico i was a choreographer i was a dance teacher but most of my work even if i, I had no idea what dance really was about I, I was i had zero technique i was able to really nurture others by coaching them it's something that i i really enjoy to do and and I got obsessed with it, and I'm still obsessed with this idea of how how you can help others to to be better. Like mm-hmm. if I think of my work too in, in packaging, most of the times I redesign. So one of the models that I have written here in my notes, like in my manifesto, is uh, leave it better than you found it. Mm-hmm. And that is this idea of, of doing that with people too. Like if someone is coming to you for help, or if, if you are just I don't know, a person or an object, um, do your best in, in have a good impact on things. And that's something that, I, that I'm that i obsessed with. Nowadays, I feel like there is a huge stigma on, um, there has always been the idea of the designer being born out or like working after hours and as a sign of success, like the more you have, the better you are doing. And, and, I, and I've seen that, I see for people it's an obsession, but it's, it is in the long run, it's not manageable and it's not healthy. So, so it's something that that I am obsessed with in trying to <laughs> mean like remove it, banish it from <laughs> from the equation. I mean, it's not is is my task to do. I'm not going to put that weight on my shoulders. But if at least I can do it with my community, that are my clients and my peers mm-hmm. at the roster and closer and closer, or even with like with the team of closer and closer, which are like the manager, the agents, and and trying to communicate that, I think I can have more impact on 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 my small community. Yeah, I think that's a really a really noble goal to to encourage that and to kind of set that example. So it's it's easy to say people shouldn't work so hard and you know run themselves ragged, but then when you do it to yourself, it's kind of hard to <laughs> it's hard to make that point for other people. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like is. I don't know. I I have experience like in Mexico when I was in Argentina living here, like a like a, something that it is it, taken for granted. It's like yeah, what you were expecting. You're a designer. Just mm-hmm. go and work. Like I'm, 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 why? <laughs> right. <laughs> why? Like everything is just like tight deadline, tight deadline. Like like a continuous thing. And I was always wondering why. So when I have the chance to really chat with clients and and there are clients that understand more than others, I know how the industry also is, but but I know that it's doable. Like it's doable. Is is something that either can wait or can have a better management and yeah, right. be more enjoyable. Well, you've worked on some some really cool projects and worked with some really big brands already. Are there um, any companies or brands or types of design that you'd like to do, like dream dream projects in your future? Yes. <laughs> well, it, going back to this whole bad story, I always wanted to work for film. That really what brought me here to New York uh, because I want I wanted to be so bass. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I want I was studying typography at the same time that branding at the same time that motion graphics. So you can see the, the thread between them. Mm, what my yeah. what my point was. Um, so my dream project will be working for a film like a Wes Anderson film. Like maybe it's a hero prop. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe it's a whole movie. Um, but also like the work of Pedro Almodóvar, the Spanish director. I really love him. I really love all his work and his aesthetic. So doing something for him will be like huge. Um, I'm gonna be probably petrified if I get the job. <laughs> I'm gonna be like <laughs> completely overwhelmed. But um, 
I would love to do uh, that. That's my dream. Nice. Love it. I, I think, um, so as a, as a side point, I've been really obsessed lately, lately as in the past couple of years with film and photography and video and kind of learning how to use a camera again. And all mm. of, everything I learned about a camera was in one class, my first year of college, and it was just black and white film. So we had to, we had to shoot with a, an old school camera and we had to develop the film and I was not very good at it, <laughs> but it's amazing how much more show us show us. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, us maybe we'll link to a few examples and <laughs> some, some, some old Josh miles originals. Um, you know, one of, one of my most like accidental photos is one of the ones that I have printed. Like it's the only printed photo I have in the house is the one that was kind of like, Oh, I didn't expect it was going to do that. It was just as cool. Like, light trail at night, black and white. So it's like, Ooh. looks like lightning. Well, um, do send us a link about uh, Okay, these, we'll these. see if we can get a good, good scan or good photo <laughs> of the photo for that. You know, it's not digital, so I can't just, <laughs> I can't just download it for like, you. <laughs> right. That, that is like thinking of like these, well, we were talking about process, this idea of making quality tangible with these other of my motos is exactly what you were saying. Like, there's something interesting in, in doing it with like the process, like and see it with, even if it's a scan, we'll be able to to identify it as a like a tangible object, like a mm. like something that exists. Yeah. Right. And even if there are many, many, many digital things that are beautiful, those digital things that are beautiful, they also have something tactile. <laughs> yeah. So um, I feel like also I, that's why I, I love film. Uh, and I would love to work for film because like as packaging includes many things, but this is like the, who like the next step, like, or like 10, 10 steps up yeah. of like real, this really includes everything, everything. I, would love I think to do there's that. also, you know, in film, there's the, there's the actual story. So there's the, what's the plot and what are the words that they say back and forth, but but there's how you're telling that story visually. So when you go from the tight shot of somebody's hand to the wide shot of them in the room to the wider shot showing, you know, what mm. someone's seeing from the other room into that room. And then the way they stitch that together and show the opposite sides of the conversation. And there's just so much that goes in. It's so easy to do that wrong. <laughs> and I, I think not everybody when they watch a movie or a TV show gets it like when there's mm. really like they don't necessarily put their finger on it but man there's just something that's added to that story when it's so seamless and it's so beautifully put together yeah it's is again like i don't know even where to start like if i if you give me a camera i will try to do it but it's <laughs> like what you said like is really showing to others what your vision is like this is really what, it, it, like maybe that's why they call it missionaries in filmmaking because he's like, I'm really showing you like, and I'm framing this for you to see just this, and it stimulate this on you, and then I mm -hmm. move here, and this has certain pace, and then there's rhythm, and oh my god, yeah, this can go on and on and on, and we can continue talking about film. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's all um, it's I'm all so the principles of design, it. right? It's the it's taking away the things in the scene that aren't necessary. And then if you're talking about Wes Anderson, it's like all the little details of all the little things where, where some other filmmaker would have been like, take the bookcase out. And he's like, no, we're putting it in and we're filling it with all these little things. And right. And that's just part of the story that he's telling. There was this, uh, now that you're mentioning this is like, um, not my obsession, but I, I do love uh, the, these three Mexican filmmakers, Cuaron, Del Toro, and Iñárritu. Uh, so Cuaron's latest film is Roma, uh, oh, yeah. the one that is in Netflix, black and white, beautiful. And he was saying in, in one of the interviews that he even asked the set designer to fill in the drawers on the rooms with actual clothes for the for the characters. Like if the characters were really living there, like. The, the, everything should be as they were living there. So mm -hmm. even the small detail has a purpose to create the environment that they are in. And yeah, it is thinking of design is really is really about that too. Is showing everything with a purpose, but with a purpose of a stimulation and environment. Like make someone feel something, or mm -hmm. make them look something. 
this is here because of what? And I feel like most of the time we think of design as just purely aesthetic, and but without the function, it's not design. So it needs to have that sense of it's here because of a reason. And even if it's like a small, or even if it's uh, like, a, like a small detail in the illustration, it needs to tell you something as a story or like a complete the, to complete the, the, the artifacts. Um, I'm working with a mezcal right now. And yesterday I had a meeting with a client and this design is purely topographic on the front. But on the back, I was asked to do something with illustration. And, and I did illustration and everything. But one of their story, the, the origin of their company is that these two guys from, I think they're from Colorado. They went on a trip to Oaxaca. Uh, and they found themselves in the streets of Oaxaca with these lo the local people that they handed them like a gasoline jog. Like, you know, like these plastic mm -hmm. containers for, yeah. for gasoline. And they were like, go, 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 drink this. And they thought it was actually gasoline. They were so aggressive with them, like, just drink it. And they'll be mezcal. Because that's really the way that you see in local communities of mezcaleros, how they transport mezcal with these things. It's not as fancy as we think, but it is it is authentic. So I included that little, like, oh, cool. like so tiny piece of illustration but completes the story. Yeah. And I'm thinking of film. I'm I'm inspired by these filmmakers where detail is everything, like Wes Anderson, that like everything is there for with a purpose. Uh, same with Almodovar. If you guys can watch his films, um, they're amazing. And it's exactly that, like everything is angled and and there to tell you something. Mm. Awesome. Love to check him out. Um well, hey, before we let you go, um, I'm curious what your favorite maybe piece of advice that you've received is or what's your favorite piece of advice to share with other designers or illustrators? Listen to this podcast. <laughs> Listen <laughs> more to Josh <laughs> and the Obsessed podcast. Um, that's uh, advice one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, we can just stop right there. <laughs> um, yeah, it's one of the best pieces of advice I ever had is um, from when I was into lettering and calligraphy. I was spending a lot of time just, you know, practicing and practicing and practicing, very obsessed with it too. <laughs> and this teacher told me, uh, what you have to say, if you learn and you, you're, you're taught yourself to, to write this beautifully, you need to say something. Mm -hmm. And that for me was really a game changer. After that, I was, I was noticing more and more that, you know, we had these platforms that everyone was sharing their work and we had like a wave of like a boom of lettering, mm -hmm. but the words were the same. So everything right. and and really the impact of the written word is what you're saying uh we're talking about language uh on top of this uh the call when we're out of the record um and, and we're talking about Ger like Ger speaking german and, and spanish and, and english and all this and for me really like it, it may change. It, it changed everything because I was practicing everything in English. You know, you're writing hustle, uh, work harder. Like you know, the things mm -hmm. that you that I used to to see in dribble and Behance and Instagram that look great on the show. Like it looked great on your feed, but it doesn't really say anything to anyone. They're saying that you're practicing, but you can change by having uh, have a meaning. So I started getting more obsessed with that. And that was like a great piece of advice because I have used it not just for my written exercises, but also within conversation with clients uh, or with like, even in this podcast, I remember it's like, it's about like, well, you, you need to have something to say. And most of the times we, we dream of the idea of like, yeah, I want to be so bad, but he has something to say. Mm -hmm. And, and these most of the times is like what you are, doing outside your profession where you're traveling where are you eating that gets me back into why i live in new york um 
a lot of a lot of things are happening here in the city, even now in the pandemic. And for me, is having something to say, uh, which is a great source of creative when you are a designer. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that advice. Um, is there anything else you'd like to leave with our audience? Anything, any encouragement or anything you'd like to ask them or challenge them to do? I don't know what I had these in my head because last time I didn't answer it. I don't remember what I said. And then I thought, oh, I should have said this. And now I forget <laughs> it. I, I, I forgot that note again. Um, <laughs> I say um, just... Well, keep keep balance between work and and your professional uh, personal professional life. Um, what you do outside your professional side is what it will inform what you do professionally, especially in design. Um, be 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 good with yourself and and keep studying. No, don't don't go just to the computer and use the software. Keep working with your hands and uh, yeah, keep design human. Yeah. Love it. Well, Hey, tell our listeners where we can track you down on the interwebs and learn more about sure. you and follow you and, you know, buy your merch. You have merch. <laughs> <laughs> I just say, just open Google and write Abraham Lule. You'll see everything there, <laughs> but no, uh, well, the handle is Abraham Lule everywhere. Uh, I think Behance is the one that is a L U L U L E. That is Alule is my initial and my last name because that was the first thing I did when I was in college, opening up Behance and the stay like that. I'm glad it wasn't like, I don't know, hot dog 1985 or like <laughs> something like that. Uh, so it turned something like with my name. Um, yeah, Abraham Lule, Dribble, Behance, uh, Instagram. Um, I don't have Twitter, but may, might have in, in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, Abraham, even though this is the second time around, uh, I think even better this time. So thanks for chatting today. Too. Sure, sure, sure. Morning coffee with Josh. That's right. We'll we'll do it again next Friday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And thanks for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number one hundred and fifty in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Stop.